Association chat will get started in just a second. But before that, let's hear from Blake Alvin for this episode's podcast tip. Associations are usually trying to communicate with existing members and attract new members, and sometimes communicating information to the public. With so many forms of media available, it can be hard to know which is best for which situation. You can spend a ton of time, energy, and money really quickly. But what's the best way to maximize your efforts? Video is one of those options. Now, I'm not against video, but to do video well constantly can be costly and take a great team. And once you have a great video, getting somebody to sit down, watch, and absorb the information can be tricky also. I want to repeat those words again. Sit down, watch, absorb. With a well-made audio show, the audience is now freed from the screen and all the distractions that go with it. You can listen to a podcast anywhere, on a daily commute, at your kid's Little League game, mowing the lawn, vacuuming, doing your expense report, going for your daily run, making dinner, going to lunch. This allows the listener to find out more about your organization and topics on their time and when they want it. And if done right, it can be more intimate, technical, and human all at the same time. So to sum up, a podcast is cheaper than video, very intimate, eyes free and on demand, typically gets longer listen times with a deeper dive, and is easier to get somebody who's camera shot. So give a podcast a try. You can thank me later. For more tips and tricks and free information about podcasting, go to humanfactor.net. Welcome to Association Chat, produced by Amplified Growth and Human Factor, talking about all things association, nonprofit, and anything else that pops into my mom's head. And now, here is your host, Kiki Latalian. Hey, Blake, watch out for mom today. She's in a crazy mood. <laughs> I am. What's up with that? So, how's that different How than any other know? day? It's not. It's the same as every other day. Every other day? Yes. Did you see my mug? I did. How do I get one of those? You actually, if you're watching right now and you want to have your very own association chat mug, it looks like this. Or it might look a little bit different. Uh, I think I'm doing a different design next time. Then I want you to tweet out association mug life. Right now, though. it's like thug life, but it's mug life. But right now, they have to do it. You now have to do it right now. Life. Hashtag Otherwise. association. So if you're mug listening life. and it's not, what's the date today? Uh, what's the date today? It's the 29th. So is if that, it's not, if is it's that a trick if question? It's not the 29th. Don't tweet it. Is that what or, you're saying? No, actually, go ahead and tweet it. I might even send you a mug anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she might just do that. Yeah, yeah. So. So a lot of stuff's been happening in the association space right now, and obviously everybody is still talking about the fact that uh, the government shutdown is, for the time being, uh, over. Yeah, uh, We're still waiting to find out what's going to happen next. And I've been hearing from some of my friends in the association chat community about – uh, what their associations are doing in the meantime, how they're prep, you know, prepping. Yeah, what do the for... government relations people do during a government shutdown? Do they just stay home? Oh, not the government relations people. No, mm-hmm. they they don't stay home. But like everybody else who was impacted, especially here in the D.C. area, it was is crazy. Yeah. And so a lot of associations were putting out their letters. A lot of people were, you know, reaching out and saying like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and all of the associations that signed on for that um, were saying, hey, let's end this. And so we're, it's kind of a waiting game, right? We're yeah. waiting to find out what's going to happen next. Yes. Um, so we're also waiting for the great Kikini. We are we are waiting for the great Kikini. <laughs> and who knows? Maybe. Hey, Reed, I see you on there. It's great to see you. Uh, who knows? Maybe the great Kikini, who's coming in later with a guest, maybe she'll be able to predict what's going to happen with this shutdown. What's going to happen with <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Yeah. In the meantime, she knows. She knows. Yeah. And our sponsors may know. Uh, our sponsors, Human Factor, Human Workplaces, and Amplified Growth, which yeah. help us to make all of this beautiful stuff come together. 
Um, I want to go ahead and get started. We have an awesome show today. Uh, we're talking with uh, a person who I'd heard about. I'd heard all about him before actually talking with him. I had a chance to talk with him before we got on this afternoon. We're talking with David Beebe about how brands can use content and influencer marketing to win the hearts, the minds, and the wallets. Cha-ching! The wallets? We need like a cha-ching sound, yeah. <laughs> Of members and customers. Um, a little bit about David. I'm going to go ahead and read this. He's an Emmy Award and Can Lions winner who has changed the game of content. David, you have been called one of the entertainment and marketing industry's most influential branded content producers, advisors, and keynote speakers about the changing media landscape and transforming marketing from a cost center to a revenue center. Um, I have done my research a little bit, I'd say. I've listened to a lot of different interviews with you, and so I'm very excited to talk with you today about all of this. Great, well, thanks for having me. I am, uh, I, I'm in Toronto, so I feel like I'm so close to you in D.C. I know, you need um, to come on uh, down here. <laughs> you come see us. I, I, am, I am there a lot. It's, uh, I, you know, I've lived there for just over three years, and I, uh, ran creative and content at Marriott International. Um, and, but now I'm in Toronto, but I'm, it's, I feel like in the same place, still sunny, it's still snowy out. So. There you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I want to, um, I want to go back into sort of setting the stage for what we're talking about today. Sure. And um, one of the things that you talk about all the time is a need for brands to create these brand newsrooms. And it's this idea of what you call brands publishing at the speed of culture, which I love that. But what does that mean? You know, um, what is what is publishing at the speed of culture really mean? Uh, it means two things. So uh, you have to look internally at your organization first and then uh, externally at your whatever it's your members, your customers, who you're trying to engage with. Um, so publishing at the speed of culture internally really means first breaking down silos mm -hmm. and getting people to, to think and act in real time um, and really understand the idea that community, that marketing, is, you know, it's 24 seven. We're always connected. We're always on. Yeah. And to be relevant, uh, you as a, as a brand, as an organization, you need to be there. It doesn't mean that you need to be part of the conversation every time. It doesn't mean you need to jump into conversations. But if, if there's a conversation that you are should be part of, that internally you have the structure to publish at the speed of culture, to create the content in real time, not have to wait uh, two days a week Go have three meetings. <laughs> go have a committee about yeah. it, um, because by then it's too late. Well, okay, right? right? And I mean, how many times have I mean? I've worked in digital strategy before, and one of the jobs I did not like this particular task was to create content, um, tweets, posts, all kinds of stuff for yeah. for different channels. Yeah, and they required twenty four hours. And they thought they were being gracious. This was actually something I negotiated to get 24 to 20, hours for what? 24 hours, Blake. For what? For No, let me tell you. I'm telling. For let me tell you. For <laughs> people to approve oh, yeah. these posts. And you're like, this is this is somebody commenting on something that's a hot topic in the area. Sure. 24 hours from now, right. it doesn't matter anymore, no. you know? So, um, the, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, you, the, you know, the funny thing about that is that people, you get – Internally, that's what I'm talking about publishing and breaking down those silos is that yeah. internally people get so focused on every word, the design, the look, the, is it perfect? And ultimately at the end of the day, they don't realize that one, you're, the person who's reading it really doesn't care about, you know, is it perfect? It's right. what's the mess? Yeah. And are that's you our, engaging? That's our motto, David. And what do you stand for? That's what we believe, David. <laughs> yeah, we're going for imperfection. <laughs> hey, it's it's putting it out there, and that's yeah. the biggest thing. Is is you know, organizations and brands want to do this, and then they just sit, they they talk about it and talk about it and they try to perfect it before they even do it. Yeah, and I think also another thing that I've seen that has led to a lot of the noise that's out there. And a lot of brands being ignored is that in order to meet this need to feed the content machine and constantly be out yep. there, 
what they end up doing is they create a lot of canned content that is not specific to any particular time. And then they schedule it out on the schedulers and it's just, it falls flat because who, who cares really? You know what I mean? And so um, I'm fascinated by this concept because of, for several reasons. One is that I don't see it happening a lot. I think there's a lot of room for improvement and a lot of room, a lot of opportunity, especially in the association space. Sure. So I want to ask yeah, think- you. Oh, sorry. I was, was going to say, I want to ask we're you. We're so excited to chat to each other. I know. I like you so much. I want, I want to talk to you some more. Um, so associations have this reputation for being risk averse and especially overly traditional, like um, like a government light type of thing is what I've heard right. people call it. And so, you know, is it possible in your estimation that an association can actually move this quickly? Uh yeah, it, it's again, it's going back when we talk about public, it's internal, right? Mm-hmm. It is, um, you need to change the infrastructure of how you operate. And, and so when I talk to a lot of brands about this, it's, well, this is the way we do it. This is the way we've always done it. And it's, and it's a lot of the pushback will be, well, we, we still need to do our campaigns or we still need to do stuff. And, and I'm not saying don't do that. You, yeah. you know, you still need to have stuff planned out. You still need to know what you're doing next quarter and next year and three years. But you st- but you need to have a group in the company that operates in real time and in the moment and um, is still connected to everything else that's happening, but is listening to the conversation that is listening to culturally what's happening. And then is there an opportunity to engage? Um, and it doesn't mean that you, again, you, you have to engage, but that you, you're being relevant, um, and, and part of that conversation overall. So whether that's one person or whether at like Marriott, we built the global brand command centers where there's 20 people sitting in a room, uh, you don't need to go that big. It's just the idea that you have a process in place to move fast mm-hmm. and, and, and get content out there so that you are part of the conversation when you should be. Yeah. I, one, um... one of the. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I, you know, I, I spoke last year at the American Bankers Association, um, and uh, it was a great, you know, great event and met a lot of great people there. I mean, and, and also talk about a wild crowd. It was in New Orleans, so <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> who who knew bankers relax. could be that yeah. much fun? <laughs> <laughs> we know now. Um, they got the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, it, it's not that there – I don't think it's that, that there's not that interest in doing it. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it is – it is creating change and change is hard, mm-hmm. right? And it leads back to fear. And uh, this is something I talk a lot about is it, it's the unknown. So people are fearful for their job, for their role, um, for fearful for actually breaking anything, mm-hmm. right? Fearful of what the response will be. Um, and you have to kind of let that fear go and realize your if you're not going to go out and move fast, uh, your competition or someone else will, and they will be part of the conversation and you won't. And if you look at, you know, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, Gillette ad, right. And, right. and what do they stand for? And so much debate on both sides of it. Mm-hmm. But the fact is they are part of the conversation and whether you like that ad, you agreed, you disagreed, they put it out and they said, this is our stance on it. Yeah. This is our take and like it or don't like it buy our product or don't, but we're part of the conversation. And that's where, uh, yes, there was a lot of pushback, a lot of negative comments, but they're out there with it. Um, and they, and they, and they operate in that environment where it's okay to make, if you would consider that a mistake, a a mistake and whatever, you have to have that environment first. I think it's I think it's awesome that they got everybody talking about it because for the longest time Dollar Shave Club was like the innovative shaver like shaving implement shaving company in this space, and then Gillette here we go you know we're right. actually making a commentary on what's going on in our society right now. Do we have data on if it worked or not? Like did they've lost sales? Have they gained sales? Do we have any knowledge on what's happened? The result? I don't know. Do you have any knowledge? I think on that? the I, I think right now you know I think on the sales side it's hard to, hard to say it's a little early. Soon, yeah. Um, it, there's a, I think what you're seeing is a lot of conversation right, mm-hmm. which is what they wanted, and again the, and and consumers 
or they just want to know what you what you stand for. And I think if you tie that back to an association, even what does an association stand for? Right? They know that the what their organization is for and who they're supporting as members. Mm-hmm. Um, but being vocal about that, and and also this is getting a little bit for, forward, so I won't go a lot into it. We can talk about it in a bit, but um, the the why behind it and the distribution of the content, because I tell you, I've seen a lot of association sites and a lot of associate content Mm -hmm. and it's the content in some cases is really good. It's not bad. It's just presented the wrong way or it's distributed the wrong way. And they're not building a community around it. Just kind of your point. It's make something, push it out, make something, push it out like a content factory with no thought around the why right. or who's our audience. Right. Well, one of the things that um, that I talk about a lot is is community. And people are always for years have been asking me, you know, why do you why do you spend so much time building this community? And, you know, I think it's interesting to see, well, you've talked about the connection between brand community and commerce and the fact mm-hmm. that it can actually drive business. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because I know you talk about the three C's, content, community, and commerce. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you you know, anyone can use that, whether you're a nonprofit, you're a brand, you're an, or you're an individual. Uh, how are you in that structure? So that first C is that content. Mm-hmm. What content are you going to create? So, you know, that's diving into, again, the, the why behind it is uh, from a format perspective, is it short form, long form, live? Um, and then who's the audience for it? How are you going to do it? So just what is that creative, but also understanding the distribution strategy. So many people um, and, and brands uh, will create some really great content and then they go, oh shit, where do we put this? <laughs> yeah. Right? Or, yeah. or what do we do with it? Or how are we measuring the success? And those are all questions you need to ask yourself and define before you even get into the creative. And it's something when I'm advising brands or in, in speaking is talking about breaking that down and saying, let's, let's, we'll get a general sense of what you want to do content wise. But now let's talk, let's stop. And then let's go to the very end of the process and talk about distribution. Where, how, because that then leads to the community part. Okay, right. hold on. How hold are we that thought. Build that community. We have to do hold a tease. That We're going to come back. What's he going to answer? That's you're going to answer that. Yeah. So it. he's actually going <laughs> to get into how it all ties back to community. But you'll only okay. find out if you watch this and stay through. That's right. We'll we'll be right back. Back. We don't really tune in anymore. Stay bit flowing or something. I don't know. Just just roll it. Welcome to Culture Tips. Brought to you by. Culture tip number two, look for patterns inside your culture. Culture is complex and it's not static. So when you start down the road of doing culture management, the first thing you want to look for are the interesting patterns. Don't try to determine if you're good at collaboration inside your culture, for instance, because I'm sure you'll find a couple of good examples of collaboration and put that to rest. But you miss the important part. You miss the fact that your people are naturally willing to share information, which is good, but don't tend to share it beyond the people in their department. That's not so good. It's the patterns and even the contradictions that provide the gold here. That was Culture Tips brought to you by humanworkplaces.net. You're back, Kiki. Oh, I'm so glad that we are back because I wanted to find out where we were going with what you you wanted this music. I did want this music because (laughs) it's the weather is less than perfect right now in the D.C. area. And I think we need to rev it up a little bit in the afternoon. Yeah, that's enough revving up. All right. I've got caffeine for the rest of it. Um, So, yeah. So, no, what was the question? We were talking about the connection between content, community and commerce. And so David was now going to connect uh, the content piece to the community piece. Here we go. Am I right? We we're it's perfect. Um, <laughs> and so leading that, once you know that content, that what, what you're creating, why, where you're putting in the distribution, and then that leads the community. And, and community means a lot of things, right? And it's different for everybody. So 
how do you define community? Is it building an online community of people that are going to be part of, a, let's say, a loyalty program if you're in travel, tourism, hospitality? Is it a simply social community, mm-hmm. you know, in, in different groups? Is it like shares followers as an email community? Is it even an offline community? How are you activating people online and through that content and connecting that experiential? So how are you building a community of people that believe what you believe, that like the content you're putting out, that say, yes, I want this, I want more of it, that you're going to engage further. And the trick with that is not just building the community, but then what are you doing with that community after? How are you continuing to engage? And that's another thing to look out for is they'll they'll go, great content, Mm -hmm. build that community, and then they leave them hanging there. Yeah. There's no engagement after that initial piece of content or series of content. So always thinking about how are we then continuing to engage that community with other stuff, whether it's offers or membership or even more content. Um, yeah. It's really important because remember that community is the most valuable thing. Mm-hmm. These, this is someone who raised their hand out of the 100,000 things they have to do a day and said, yes, I like this. Yeah. Right. Or I shared this. Which is incredible. That's incredible. And it's so that's where I think people see like, oh, I, you know, it's yes, everyone wants a massive amount of followers and engagement and and all of that. And it's but I think when you when you take a step back and realize, you know, how busy everyone is, how much time you have out of the day, um, the things that you're going to stop your day for and give your attention to are the things that are most valuable to you. Mm-hmm. So to break through that as a brand uh, or a, a person or association, that that it's, that in itself is a huge, um, you know, huge success. And so recognizing the value of that community. So don't leave them hanging there. I see, um, you know, a lot of brands will do a campaign, they'll build a community around it, and then that campaign is over, and then nothing else happens. Right. Um, that then leads to that third C is in how are you monetizing that community, that commerce piece of it. And again, commerce means a lot of different things. Uh, it could be memberships. It could be signups for something. It could be a, a paywall. It could be again, events. It could be wh- whatever it, you know, however you're going to derive some sort of monetary value out of that community. Um, that's the last piece. And if you get into, when I talked about it, you know, with, with premium content, because a lot of what I work on is, helping brands develop that premium content. That's your long form, um, you know, imagine the webisode series, documentaries, mm-hmm. real story, rich content, stuff that's not a campaign, things that are going to last for years. So a documentary about uh, the history of a hotel or what, or the documentary about what is your association's take on X, right? These yeah. are things that have long-term value. And so commerce in that case could mean, actually thinking and acting like a media company and making licensing that content to distributors. And um, it's a lot of what I've done with other brands is make content so valuable that not only will your audience watch it for free, that you're putting it out on your own channels, but now you're going to turn around and be able to license it to other people. And by license, I mean to other distributors. So imagine a Netflix, a Hulu, a international yeah. distributors, all these people that are building OTT apps, they need content. And it's absolutely possible um, but people don't think like that in marketing, right? They think, here's my message. Here's what I yeah. want to say. Engage with it. Go home. Well, and that's fascinating, too, that you bring that up because um, one of the things that I – it just made me even even more excited to interview you today was that you have mentioned before how great it is for, for uh, different organizations to hire – people with a journalism background. Of course, I have a journalism background. Oh, imagine that. Yeah. So, um, (laughs) but what's interesting is that I've ended up meeting a lot of different people who are doing all kinds of fascinating things in like not just associations, but all over. And I think this is a really interesting time when journalism itself is going through a big change. But the people who have all those skills are able to do so many different things including telling stories and helping to they they identify you know ways to package that together ways that you can communicate that to people so can you talk to me david a little bit about um that connection and you know i don't know why it is that you think that 
uh, people should maybe revisit some of the skills that they're looking to hire for when uh, trying to build out a real time, you know, marketing team. Yeah, I think if you go back to that, what you're talking about, that idea of a journalist, right? And it's um, why that is so important is because uh, they were trained to tell stories mm -hmm. that engage audiences first versus a marketer was trained to market products and services and benefits and features. Right. Right. Um, now that obviously has changed in a lot of marketing now, right now it's a lot of stuff is story led. And I also want to point out, you know, I am a big advocate of brand storytelling. Um, but I am not by any means saying that should be your only strategy. Right. Right. It doesn't right, mean right. throw everything else out the window. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a speaker's ad the other day um, that was talking about storytelling and said, stop wasting money, you know, do leave with storytelling, stop wasting money on ads. And it was an ad that was running. <laughs> <laughs> I've so I actually like, <laughs> seen that before where people do that. I was like, you're, you're bashing on advertising, but you're, you're advertising. Yeah. So uh, people, a lot of people talk about the death of this and that. And, you know, the, the fact is, the, do certain things still work? Yes. Do certain things not work as well as they used to? Absolutely. Certain things dead? Yes. Um, but there is that it goes back to whether you, let, let's call it creative, let's call it content, whatever that content is, it's got to be valuable. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you look at how do you create content that's so valuable, someone's going to stop and take their time to engage with it. They're going to share it. They're going to talk about it. It typically is something that is going to lead with either something that's very controversial yeah. or a story. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could consider Gillette thing. It's a story in a sense, right? They are, they are telling a, something that they believe in that they want to stand for um, around a story. So journalists um, understand that and that's how they were trained. It's the same thing for me. I, I came out of the television business. Mm -hmm. I produced television in, in Los Angeles for 15 years and I was trained to tell stories that consumers wanted to engage with. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't decide just to go make Lost or Ugly Betty or Desperate Housewives because we liked the, we thought we liked it. It was consumer <laughs> right. research and data and what's the cultural conversation. And another example, look at when Roseanne came back. Yeah. Right? yeah. Roseanne came back because of a conversation happening in middle America. It was the right time for that show to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at that, a lot of the, a lot of old shows are still coming back because they're paying attention. So to relate that to a journalist or a marketer is how are you creating content that, that's relevant in, in that moment? So journalism is so important. And that could be a, a journalist like a writer. It could be a host. It could be a producer. Um, and, and there's different types of, you know, when you're hiring those roles, when you're building out a, a newsroom, let's just call it that. Um, it does again, it does, people get so afraid oh we don't have the money we can't build a newsroom doesn't mean you have to go build the washington post newsroom right 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 it's quite yeah. impressive by the way but it's, <laughs> you it is it's about having a team of people that are unified and understand the storytelling techniques that are going to engage people so a writer a producer whatever it may be well, that's and that's one of the things I wanted to ask you is a lot of uh, associations are these small staff associations. And so they might hear something like real time newsroom or media newsroom, brand newsroom, and just be like, yeah, uh, I am the marketing membership and communications director <laughs> and for caterer. my organization and caterer. And, and I take out the trash. I right, the coffee right. in the morning. <laughs> um, and so for them, they may feel like this just isn't possible. What's a good starting point for them, you know, to start to embrace some of the things that you're talking about here, but maybe they can't go out and immediately hire on five new people to take on different roles? Well, I think the first step is is just starting. Yeah. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, that idea, don't, don't take six months and sit around talking about it. Yeah. You know, it's it's figure out how do you start and start small and just do it. That's the only way that you learn, um, you know, with at Marriott, people would say, well, you yeah, that's that's great. But that was Marriott. I started with one person mm -hmm. and we tested and we tried things and you see what works. Um, and that's not expensive to do. And you have to have permission to fail um, and and not operate in a committee. And you, and you do need to and I talk about breaking down silos, not operate in a silo. It still needs to be the connected everything's, but have the, the leeway and the freedom to, to do those things. And can so I, first of all, it's, 
Can I just go starting. back for a second? I didn't yep. realize that you started with just one other person doing this at Marriott. I mean, I just, I guess I imagine when I, when I heard about the, the five M lives, like brand newsrooms and stuff, I must've missed out on the timeline and that whole story of how all of this evolved into what it is today. So uh, that's kind of surprising yeah. actually to me. It, uh, it, it was one by one, like you would build it anything else, one, yeah. one step by one step. And uh, you know, the, the first year, the budgets were not that big mm -hmm. and people might laugh at that, but I'm uh, seriously not that big. Uh -huh. um, and that's where you have to get very, very creative in how do you create, start testing content at, at scale and who do you hire? And the first, you know, couple of people I hired. So we launched Marriott Traveler. We hired journalists, and it's a travel publication online. Um, we hired Mark Razor, who was a reporter at Variety Magazine in LA for 17 years and had covered entertainment. Um, but he understood the idea of how to create content that travelers would like. None of the content is about it, the hotels, mm -hmm. it's all destination marketing content. And I think that's the mistake when people get into creating a magazine or a publication, it's talking about themselves. So going back, question is first define first start and then it's okay who what, what do we want to try you don't do it all don't say i'm going to build a newsroom i'm going to go do this and i'm going to build a film and i'm going to go uh do premium content and a magazine like just start in one area and i think with associations what i recommend is two different areas mm -hmm. one is start with uh some sort of premium storytelling. Um, and I'm not saying that because that's what a lot of what I do it, it because it, it, that content's going to give you the most value yeah. and identifying what, uh, what story do we want to tell that our members are passionate about, but that also would resonate with other people. Um, and, and I want brands and, and this is happening now and you're seeing a lot of it is to get in because a lot of people did films before, right? Yeah. Scripted films or other things is to think about in the documentary space. Mm -hmm. How do I investigate something? I don't know, you know, how do I explore a topic um, and, and do it in an interesting way that's not only going to engage my membership, but other people out there and also bring in new members. And that's what I mean by premium content. It's not that expensive to do that kind of documentary type storytelling. You can find journalists and producers that can do it, um, you know, a, a great cost today because it's, it used to be expensive to do that, but it's not anymore. Um, and the other second part is, is a content area to focus on is in the, what I call it a digital magazine call, uh, don't call it a blog, give it a name, <laughs> give it its own brand. Yeah. Um, and you know, some of, there's a lot of great examples out there. One of the ones that I, you know, reference a lot is, is, you know, like cmo.com. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, it's run by Adobe and that, yeah. that's, that's an, it has and excellent content. Excellent. Um, and they're like, well, why does, why does, why are they spending all this money running this content about technology and marketing? Well, because they're collecting all that data and they're building a community around it and they're going to turn around and they're going to market it, market yeah. their products to you. Yeah. Um, and it's okay. And you're going to be fine with that because they provided that value to you first, but they didn't go out and say, we're launching the Adobe blog. Right. They went out and launched, built their own brand around it. And Oracle does the same thing. Um, so there's a lot of B2B. And I think in associations, there's a huge opportunity to do that. And I'll go, you know, mention American Bankers Association again, um, only because I know them well. Mm -hmm. They have a blog that they run and I've, uh, you know, have pushed them and would love to do it. But it's like there's so much content out there. Like turn that into a, a thing. Why? Why? aren't there? Why isn't your association being the, the trusted source for banking or finance news? Right. Right. If you right. look at, and this is going to be controversial to the audience, and I'm not getting into um, politics at all, but um, you know, the, the, the NRA runs NRA TV. Mm -hmm. It is a full blown media company. Um, and it started off, they're saying, and this is the same thing anyone can do. What do I stand for? What do I believe in? They say, and they're, they've changed, but we, we want to represent the Second Amendment. So we're going to, because we can't have our own voice, or mm -hmm. we don't think we can have a voice, or we think we're misrepresented, we're going to create our own content. And if you look at what they've built, 
Yeah. Um, it is a fully functioning 24 seven news channel that looks and feels like a CNN or Fox or whatever with their own host, their own content, their wow. own magazine. And so that's what I'm saying. What is that space that you want to own? And then how do you build that community around that through content that is ultimately around that theme or that white space or that narrative that you want to lead? Yeah. There's no reason why you can't launch uh, your own, you know, live streaming thing or web. So, I mean, look, yeah. you know, take example what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you know, you could go out and try to pitch yourself as a host to someone and get a sponsorship and go to someone else's world. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, look, I'm going to build what I want to build and talk about and stand for. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to get sponsors. I'm going to build a community around it. It's the exact same thing because this is, this is your narrative. This is your white space. Yeah. So yeah, we, had, we had a we association had a, should be doing the same thing. We had a, a, a client come to us and want to do a white paper on how to make a podcast. Wait, what? They wanted to do a white paper on how to first, make the a first thing I had to do is look up what a white paper was. Oh, God. And then, <laughs> and, then I, and then I tried to explain them over and over. We just have to start doing it. I and see. And they were like, what are we going to talk about? And I said, um, let's open your newsletter. Let's well, start there. So what I love about this, though, is is it's. If you think about it, yeah, if it were the Adobe, I never thought about it that way, but if it were the Adobe blog, I really probably wouldn't care as much. It, it actually would turn me off. It would have the, the opposite feel? effect. Yeah, it would be, well, and it would right. feel like this is their corporate blog, you this know, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't feel like the valuable content that it is, but I was literally just reading through like three different pieces of content from there yesterday thinking about how great a job they do and um but it, i didn't think about the fact that the name the branding of it had such a great impact one thing that you say all the time is you talk about the fact that an individual can be you know a media company that it, it's each one of us walks around with the ability to film record do whatever create content and it's funny in a way, not funny, haha, but odd. I think <laughs> that it takes it takes these large organizations um, so long to wrap their head around the fact that it you don't have to just talk about the one thing that you do. But this is the way we've always done it, right? You you talk about the thing that serves the ideal audience that you have, right? The people that you're trying to bring into consuming whatever it is that you're producing. And so so I think that's fascinating. Yeah. And is. if you if you look at if you look at you know their example of CMO.com and again this applies to to everybody is they've actually turned that into a business. Yeah. So and that's where I talk about transitioning marketing from a, a cost center to a revenue center. And mm -hmm. people are like, what does that even mean? <laughs> um on, you know, on the premium side, what I mean by that is and make an investment, distribute, then go get licensing dollars to help fund more. Um, in this world of building a quote digital magazine or community online around content like CMO.com, uh, they have so much traffic and so much engagement that they're selling space, advertising space and sponsored content to other people, other brands that now want to reach their community. Mm -hmm. And it's no different than what yeah. we built with Marriott Traveler. It's the same thing. It's no different than what other brands are starting to do and realizing what is that? And as I said, like you said, that one thing, but what ladder that up to that overarching narrative. And yeah. so, you know, one thing when people talk about storytelling, everyone's talking about brand storytelling. This is the way absolutely true or content marketing, but that those are silos of content versus what is a narrative? A narrative sits at the very, very top. And then you develop stories that support that narrative. And that's what's key is what are all those different stories that ladder up to your narrative? So if a, a publication or if a association was to go create a, a let's just start with whatever a, a blog they're going to create or what they're going to call it their own brand they're going to build a community around that they're going to build an audience well now that community not only becomes valuable to them but to other people so you start to monetize that audience mm -hmm. to other people that want to reach your community um and, and that's going back to the idea where we talked about everyone's a media company um, and when I do a lot of keynotes and events and people will say, and I'll say, how many people in here are media, would consider themselves a media company? And very few ever raised their hands. Yeah. And, and what we do is we walk through, what, what do I mean by that? And it means, think about it like this. You as an, let's take an individual, all of us 
uh, or most of us probably have a, a, a you know, a, a this, mm-hmm. which is a TV station essentially in our pocket, yeah. right? And I am now a broadcaster. And as an individual, I take a photo um, or I write something and I decide what platform I'm going to put that on. So content, that's my, the content I've created to tie it back to that strategy. Um, so if it's a, a fun, uh, maybe a, a friend's photo or a family photo, I'm going to decide I'm going to put that on Facebook. Yeah. Maybe just Facebook because that's the community I built on Facebook. That's what they care about. Um, I'm not going to put it on LinkedIn because the audience there doesn't care, mm-hmm. nor is it maybe appropriate or should it be, right? It's a right. different understanding of different things. I then put it out and, and publish it. And then I wait to see how many likes it gets or how many comments or how many shares. You're thinking and acting like a media company, essentially. Exactly the same thing that they do. They create content, they put it out, they see what people are saying about it. How are they reacting? Now, as an individual, if you're not building your own brand, uh, which is a whole nother topic we can talk about, uh, on another yeah, chat. Right, is, right. That's a whole other chat. By the way, right, I'm totally going to find you in Toronto and make you do this again. Yes. But you're, you're thinking and acting like a media company, right? Mm-hmm. And, and even in some cases, and I, you know, and, and that's what I'm trying to get people to think you, you're creating content, you're distributing content, you're seeing the reaction yes. to it. And in some cases, you probably delete it because you didn't think it got the likes that you wanted. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, right? I used to think I was well, above that, by the way. I used to think I was above that. And it's true. Like that Instagram post only got five likes. Uh, oh, took it down. Like, no. We'll pretend like that well, never one, happened. Yes. <laughs> one of the, uh, the other points to make real quick uh, is that um, I think, uh, at least I do, and I think other people do, is we, when we put content out, whether you're a brand or an individual, um, we, if something got 10 likes, 20 likes, whatever, we, we think that's, that's the amount of people that saw it. Right. Right. And we forget that. No, that's the amount of people that actually engaged with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that, you know, early on when I would share content on, on Facebook and then, or on Instagram, and then I would see someone that I haven't seen for a long time. They're like, Oh, how was that event or that right. trip? Or right. and I'd be like, right. how do you know about that? Yeah. <laughs> and you forget that a lot of people are seeing it. And so Mm -hmm. when you talk about measurement, don't forget, don't discount. um, One of the things that you really can't measure necessarily is that how many people saw it and uh, maybe they will engage with it later. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I just, I do this all the time. I see someone's post on LinkedIn or whatever. And I, I'm like, Oh, I, I, maybe I won't engage with it. Um, but then a couple of days later, I'll be creating something. I'll be like, wait, who was that person that posted something about that? And I have to go back and find it. Yeah. And then I'll engage with it and it creates the value in the moment. Yeah. Stacy Steele over here is watching and I'm so glad that you're watching on YouTube. I've been trying Stacey to sort of. Stacy Steele. Yeah. Stacy Steele. What a name. fantastic name. <laughs> I know. Stacy Steele. I believe in you, Stacy Steele. Um, even though giant companies are now publishing good content on their blogs, Kiki's right, their sheer size is intimidating and therefore the content seems impersonal. Where's the middle ground? Meaning a single person may not be taken seriously as a media company while a giant corporation is too big and therefore less reachable or personal. There's got to be a happy medium. And it's that is true. I mean, you know, what I think is is fascinating is that, you know, it comes into and I want to ask you about this influencer marketing component of everything uh, in just a second. But what it comes to is, you know, how is it that you're creating something, no matter what the size, that people are going to care about? Like, like what's going to actually reach people and make them, you know, it not just have relevance, but also resonance where it makes them care, feel, do something. And, and so, and that's different for all types of, of people, individuals, organizations based upon, you know, your own voice, your own culture, what it is that you're trying to accomplish, your audience, a number of things. One of the things that has been getting a lot of attention and a lot of really negative press too Um, is this idea of influencer marketing. For a little bit, Mm -hmm. it was like the answer to everything. And then now we're seeing, you know, uh, documentaries that are all about like, you know, 
basically these influencers who, you know, for today, I got sponsored to drink this coconut water right. and it's everything, you know. Speaking of that, by association chat mugs. It, it's, <laughs> it's the thing. It's the thing that everybody loves to watch and hate, right? And hate on because they're just fascinated by this whole thing. And I see a lot of organizations, if they decide to invest in influencer marketing, going about it in probably not the smartest way. So could you maybe speak to that, talk a little bit about influencer marketing that might be a good <laughs> like a good strategy for well, folks? But is it, is it what are people of, yeah. getting but wrong? Maybe it's the kind of thing where it's like influencer marketing, like you were talking about earlier about blog. If I know the person's an influencer, like you were saying, if it's a blog, no one, it's like you'd be turned off by it. Well, so if it's that apparent that someone's, I want to hear what David has to say. I know. We have to mind. listen to David. I know, David has to answer this. Go for it, David. Yep. <laughs> uh, that, that is, uh, influencer marketing is a whole, that's a whole series. I know. Could do. I know. Uh, you know, I think it, you know, it resurfaces every day because something else happens. And so the latest thing is with the fire festival and the documentary that came out and, yes. and talking about that. Um, and a lot of people are like, you know, influencer marketing fraud doesn't work. The fact is though, the reality is it worked. Yeah, it did. It totally right? did. So it wouldn't it have worked. been the, the debacle the failure, that it was, right? It wouldn't have been the, the debacle was, it was the event. Right, right. Um, you want to talk about, you know, one thing around this, uh, you know, people are working so hard to create content that, that resonates or gets engagement and an account, you know, posts a picture of an egg. Right. And to get more likes or whatever on Instagram than uh, the, was it Kylie Jenner or one of the, yes. whichever one it was, the Kardashian, you know, and that, that went sort of I can't remember viral. if it was Kendall or Kylie, but yeah. Kendall and yeah. Kylie, I, I get them all mixed up. But <laughs> the, the point is, it was a picture of an egg. Yeah. And yeah. to your point earlier, associations and brands are spending three weeks in a conference room talking about the color red or a letter. Right. Right now, I, I don't know who's behind the egg. Uh, it's probably a brand of some sort, <laughs> or maybe we'll find out. But it's it, how do I go back? It's not that hard um, to. I, I think we complicate it as marketers, and we we make it complicated. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying don't go la don't go latch on as an association and post a picture of an egg now because it's, it's too late. It's not relevant and shouldn't be part of that conversation, but I think if influencer marketing and in, in general, uh, does it work? Yes. I, I, I do believe in it. I think there's certain verticals that are oversaturated where it's not um, necessarily effective anymore. And it's become a sea of sameness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and travel is one of those places. And it's one of the verticals I'm working in now is, is when you look at any, uh, particular, what I will say is hotel feed, it's literally, all the same. You cannot tell the difference. Yeah. Um, does that content work? Yes. Um, but why, why not try something different? And so when you look at influencer marketing in that space, uh, it's the same thing. If I see one more picture of an influencer waking up in bed and they're perfectly, you know, with their bed and breakfast on the bed, I'm like, nobody wakes up like that. I uh, I you know, nobody, know. Nobody looks all like of that. us uh. in the association <laughs> hospitality realm. We yeah. know what the truth is. You we do know not work. Is. Like, yeah. And, and wouldn't it be more I interesting that, to see a little see more strung out something? I don't, I don't need to see you strung out. But yeah, no, it would Hungover. be. Well, at least it would get more views. It probably get a lot more engagement. <laughs> we have great coffee at our hotel. There you go. Hung over when you did a party. Hung over. <laughs> I think the question you have to ask is when it's for marketing is, and this is one of the most important things is, is, um, so my post got lots of light, lots of likes, and that's great metrics. And you, you made a great report and everyone's happy. But what does that actually mean? And mm -hmm. when you look at a lot yeah. of influencer accounts, um, you see, if you actually read the comments, no one's actually talking about the brand necessarily. They're talking about the influencer. And what the brand's doing is helping build that influencer and they're paying them a ridiculous amount of money to do it. Right. Again, it doesn't mean it doesn't it work. It, it can work. There's a ton of great case studies where it has worked. It goes back to finding who's the right influencer and also validating their audience. Um, spend time. Who is, who is their audience? What content do they create? Um, and is it relevant to my audience? And do those things, those two things 
uh, mesh. Um, yeah. Because if they don't, uh, you're, you may get a lot of likes, but you're not going to get conversions. I just uh, want to so say you get something. that traffic, but then it's dead. Right. I want to say something right now to the folks over on YouTube watching live. I, Stacy Steele, who still, even though I now know the history behind the, the name, uh, Stacy Steele, great name, great comments. Thank you so much for participating. Send her we, a mug. I am. Well, I was about to say oh, that. See? Ding, to, ding, ding, ding. Is this the okay. mug plug? Mug plug time? Mug plug. Um, to <laughs> I wasn't planning on doing it exactly right now, but I have to say you have won the mug for today's show for participating the absolute most. Uh, so thank you so much for your comments. Um, Stacy's talking a lot about our influencer conversation and just how she's, you know, saying that people are sick of celebrity worship. And Adele's weighing in here. You guys, let me know also in the comments how you're feeling about the new format for the show and for the participation on Association Chat Live on YouTube. All right. Yay. I'm sending a mug your way, Stacey Steele. Do we have her address? How does that work? Anyway? She needs to email me, kiki at <laughs> amplifygrowth.net. I don't even know how we did that. Well, now, <laughs> now you know. know. Yeah, now you know. Usually I send a, a separate message. Who gets the last question? Who gets the last question? Yeah, because we run out of time here on this. Well, screen. it's not it's not you. Yes, we're running out of time, no. and I know we still have to have the great Kikini on. Um, I do want to ask you one final question, sure. and we talked about um, influencer marketing. We talked about a lot of these things, but what we didn't really talk about is, you know, how do you identify that in the moment trending news, trending story that is right for your brand, for your organization to become a part of? Uh, it, I, I think, first of all, that you have to be listening to know what's happening. Yeah. Um, I don't be listening by um, being online and looking at stuff. You have to have a, a process in place, and it goes back to, to the data that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether that is a, a social listening platform um, or a full-blown command center or something in between, it is knowing, first of all, identifying what do I need to be listening to? There's mm -hmm. so much out there. So first it's cutting through the clutter. What's important to me? Um, what, what is trending? Um, and then a process in place to identify, okay, here's something that's trending out of what I, the world I'm going to build content and a community around. Then the question is, do we engage? Do we create content around it? Um, and, and the answer doesn't always have to be yes. A lot of brands get in trouble uh, because they try to engage in conversations they shouldn't be a part of mm -hmm. just because they see something trending. Um, so it does have to, to match up, but it goes back to using, using that real time data. Um, and there's, uh, there's some technology, uh, I, I use in the Marriott and we always build them with a technology called ticker, um, that, uh, is really good at visualizing all that data. That's, okay. um, th that's the biggest challenge. Uh, you, you talk about content, so much content there's just so much data out there too right so how do you how do you break through to even know what you should be doing right um so i i you know i'd say start you have to have some sort of listening solution in place to identify and and seeing what what's being said in, in the moment in, in real time not not presenting something two weeks from now I love it. So I am showing your website, David, uh, right now. Blake, if you want to show that it's on the up. screen. And then uh, I just want to thank you so much for stopping by. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, LinkedIn is probably one of the best ways. Um, okay. Or uh, it's David at David Beebe. Um, a lot of people spell my last name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, LinkedIn uh, is uh, the best way. That's uh, where I communicate and then uh, go from there. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you for having me. All right. So you guys, what do you think? What do you think about all of these great things that we heard? I know that we were going to have the great Kikini on. She's coming. Is she coming? You're, yeah. All right. So if you guys are ready, I, I'm ready for a little bit of future telling. We have Kiki... Kikini in the studio, and she brought a special guest. She did? She did. There's two people. They needed a special entrance just for today. All right. Well, yeah. let's get out of that chair. And bring All her right. In. I got to bring him in.
No. Great Kikini, is this you? It is I, the great Kikini. Kikini, welcome, great Kikini. Ha- yes. Everything's well? Everything is well, and along with me today, I have my trusty orb, my all seeing eye into the spiritual association realm. The spiritual Associoso. Realm. And with both of us, I've brought another seer. Another seer? Yes. We're going to get double the advice? Double the advice. Who is it? The great Gogino. It's the great Great Gogino. Gogino. Welcome, great Gogino. Also pronounced Gogini. Welcome. Depends on where you're from. Yes. She speaks through feathers and through the occasional spoken word. Only as the spirits see fit. So, Great Kikini, we have a we have a um, a paper as usual mm-hmm. with a question for you. Mm. Oops, music down a little. I've not even read it yet. Yes. Are you ready to hear it, Great Kikini, Kikini, and Great Gogini? I am ready for all, Blake. Wonderful. Here we go. Okay, so here it is. Uh, we invited a well-known speaker to keynote our conference. He's well known for encouraging people to be innovative and it's especially hard on meeting planners who use traditional room setups. But I'm afraid we're in big trouble. Big trouble, Kikini and Gogini. We did a theater in the round kind we did a theater in the round kind of stage, and when our presenter found out, he refused to go to our conference. I'm so disappointed, but I'm also confused and a little frustrated. What do you think where do we go wrong? And thank you for helping your advance, Megan. Ah. Gogini, come to me, come to me, let us, yes, I hear you, speak your words. Chocolate. Chocolate? Chocolate, yes, I see it so well, (laughs) so clearly. Could you, could you put that into the, to the mortal world? Gogini says chocolate, and when she says chocolate, what she's really referring to is the true reason that the speaker is not going to your theater in the round. Oh, dear friend who wrote in, it was never about the theater in the round. No, your innovation for production, for learning, it it has its merits, but that is not why your great keynote speaker said no. Well, why, why, why? We're on the edge of our seat. It is, in fact, reminding me much of this ball, this orb, this round thing that represents the sun, the moon, and the way your stomach feels after about 15 cups of coffee at an annual conference. Yes. (laughs) It is because your speaker ate too much chocolate, and after his chocolate binge, he gained 30 pounds. And that 30 pounds means, yes, that he no longer looked good in the round. He was, in fact, too round. I see. (laughs) I get it. So is the moral don't book in the round, or or what should we do? Should we we, uh, make sure they're aware of that up front? What do you think, Gogini or Kokini? Mm, Do you have any words, Gogini? I think you do. You wrote them right here. It says, tap dancing. That arena, fairy princess, veterinarian. Hmm. You see, you knew it. Your hands knew it. You wrote it out before (laughs) you even knew. Yes. And when she says that or writes that, what she's really saying is, that's your next keynote speaker. That's the one. Have at it. Choose somebody active. They're going to look good in the round anyway. Thank you, Great Kikini. Oh, Kikini. you are so welcome. Oh, so see you so. And back next. And thank you, Kikini. Will you two be back? Yeah. Outlook is good. My oh. sources respond with positivity. She whispers too. I see. Well, yes. we will see the Great Kikini and Gugini. Next time. Ah. 
Well, that was a thing. That was more than a thing. That was an amazing thing. That was, Come on. That was a thing. We learned a lot. I know we that. did. We learned a lot from the great Kikini, from the great Gogini, from from David Beebe, of course. David the Beebini. The Beebini. Be- be- <laughs> I don't know how you said that so quickly and easily. And there's people on that we know tuning in more there and more every week. There are people. Like we were Carolyn able to, Schnair. I know. Carolyn Schnair. We've got Del Sears, Stacey Steele, who we have agreed has the most amazing name ever. Yeah, it could be a porn name, too. Yeah. So. We also missed some good comments that were out there by H.A. Richards. He talked about... What's the egg association doing with the egg? That was a good question. What's the what? The egg association doing with the egg. Oh, I figured it was like the dairy association. Listen, I want to tell everybody that they should find out more information about what association chat. I will. Yeah, do it. What Association Chat is doing on associationchat.com. But also, also, you need to come back next Tuesday to hear from Eric Kuhn. He is... He is talking about from Hollywood to Silicon Valley to Broadway to associations. What can we learn from Hollywood's first social media talent agent Uh, in the years that he has been doing that and been instructing all kinds of different corporations on what they need to do with social media? What do we need to do with social media? What do we need to do? What do we need to do? We. <laughs> okay, so thank you for joining. I hope that you guys can win one of these spectacular association chat keep mugs. Keep tweeting. You got to keep tweeting. Keep you got to keep watching. You got to keep sharing and participating and and listening to the daily flash briefings. How do I do I, that? I have giveaways there too. Go to your Amazon Alexa and look for Association Chat News. It's no, you got to go in the in the website first, right? You don't. You don't even have to do that. You, you don't even have Alexa? to do that. You just go to Alexa and enable your skill, or you can uh, go and find out how to enable your skill on uh, associationchat.com. I know, it's so simple. A child could do it. (laughs) You ready to get out of here? I am. All right. Let's go. Here she comes. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to Association Chat, produced by Amplified Growth and Human Factor. For more information on Amplified Growth, go to AmplifiedGrowth.net. And for more information on making podcasts for your association, go to Human Factor at HumanFactor.net. To hear past episodes, go to the Association Chat YouTube channel and subscribe. See you soon!